Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Samantha Muka. She prefers to go by Sam. And she's going to discuss how public aquariums have supported marine conservation research and communicated research outcomes to the public. She got her bachelor's degree and her master's degree from Florida State and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in the history and the sociology of science. She currently is an assistant professor at, <coughs> excuse me, at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's a wonderful institution. It, she, before she joined them, or I guess maybe she had joined, but she had a Smithsonian postdoctoral fellowship, uh, and she has worked at the Smithsonian uh, on a variety of things about aquariums and how tanks that are used in aquariums have evolved over time. And she particularly focused there, I think, on coral reef tanks. <clears throat> She's writing a book about the history of aquarium tank craft and how it's evolved over time. She's written a number of very important articles and book chapters about aquariums and the roles that aquariums play and should play in marine conservation. Please join me in welcoming Sam Buka to the aquarium. Hi. <laughs> that was a um, fantastic introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and in a second, my PowerPoint will be up, and it's going to be amazing. Um, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> for the everything um, that it should be. Um, so just a, a preview, so I am a historian and sociologist of science, which might be something that you know about, might be something that you are uh, not aware of, awesome. And um, Awesome. So basically what I do is I um, am particularly interested in the history and current structure of marine biology. So basically how it is that we know what we know about the ocean's inhabitants and their relationship to the environment. So biology writ large, right? Um, what do we know about them and how do we know that? And when I started working on this project, which is a long time ago now, um, I realized that there are a lot of people that contribute to knowledge about the ocean, right? Um, biological oceanographers, this large group of people that is multidisciplinary, just called biologists, right? Um, and that includes people that study the smallest organisms all the way up to people who are mammologists, right? They all uh, fall into this weird category. People at public aquari uh, aquariums, uh, aquarists, and then hobbyists, and, and there are some aquarists that are hobbyists. There's also anglers, citizen scientists, and environmental activists. All of those groups kind of contribute to our knowledge of the ocean, um, some, many of them in different ways. And so when I first, when I first started doing this subject, I thought uh, the way that I would catch this large group of people is that I would look at environment, right? Everyone goes to the ocean. Um, this is a picture. I got a little bit stuck on it the other day while I was making this PowerPoint because I'm in New Jersey. And I was like, oh, the ocean. Um, this is at Fort Pierce, Florida, right outside of the St. Lucie County Aquarium where I was doing some field work. Um, so I wrote, I wrote a whole dissertation on um, institutions, right, and people who go to the ocean to study the ocean. And I really only got a few groups, mostly academic biologists who had PhDs, and occasionally an aquarist if there was an aquarium in that area. But um, it didn't really do what I wanted to do, and so I started studying something else. <laughs> I started studying tank craft, right? And so this is an image from the um, marine census that went on, and it's a, a picture on lizard reef, but it's a biologist using a portable aquarium to look at um, an organism that he's just collected. But what I found is that um, if you study tanks and the way that people keep organisms alive in tanks, the way that they develop model systems to understand the larger ocean, um, you get this really cool group of people. It's interdisciplinary, so you get biologists, you get um, veterinarians, you get hobbyists, and they're all talking to each other in a language that can be understood, right? It's chemistry or um, taxonomy or species or a lot of those different things. It's really transdisciplinary in the sense that 
you you just go pretty much everywhere. <laughs> Um, people on multiple levels. So you have people in a laboratory that are BAs, there's PhDs, there's postdocs, but then you have people um, having the same conversations that never went to college, which is fantastic. Um, and that's for professional levels as well. It's international, so I didn't, I wasn't getting stuck in America, where yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on, but it's not the whole story. Um, and also, there's a lot of different skills. So you get a lot of tank. Uh, engineering, you get people who are really, really good at tinkering with water flow and chemistry, but then you get animal care and breeding, people who are trying to figure out what an animal eats and how to get them to stay alive or how to breed. Um, and then people who are looking at um, developing a larger kind of community in a tank, which is a, a different structure, right? So I felt like this was the way to go. This is what I've been doing for a while now, is tracing a bunch of different tanks. And so, for instance, when you look at interdisciplinary and professional levels, um, this is the back of the tank at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian. There's a, a saltwater tank there. And in this picture, there are three people working on the same tank. Um, let's see if this will work for me here. Uh, probably not. Um, so the gentleman on the left is a... Um, He's a professional aquarist. He comes in, he cleans the tank, he does all the chemical levels um, and makes sure that everything is kind of uh, within the right range. Um, the person in the middle is an aquatic vet from the National Aquarium and he comes down um, every month to check on the animals that are in the tank. And uh, the woman in the right is a microbiology PhD student who's there actually to take samples back. And they're all actually working on the tank because um, they have, a, um, they have a fungal disease in that tank that comes and goes. It's a white fungus, and it's rotting um, their coral away. And so they're all working to figure out what this particular disease is. What's really useful about that is that it's a wide community of people working on the same tank. And that information is not just going into the academy. So a microbiologist is taking these samples back. Um, but it's also going kind of into the hobbyist community and into the vet community. So all of these people are kind of spreading this knowledge that's happening in that one tank into a wider group. Um, this one didn't particularly work out, but one of the tank systems that I study is um, uh, photographic tanks, right? So unfortunately, these are layered incorrectly, but over here, there's a picture of Walter Shute, who's the first director of the shed, using a photographic tank. Um, and then over here, this is um, a group in the field, and this is um, Jeff Williams, who's at the Smithsonian, using pretty much the exact same system in the field um, very recently to do the same work. So basically, my work traces this system um, all the way through and says, how did all of these people learn to do this thing? Who taught them and how is it useful? So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about one particular thing, which is how important public aquariums are to tank craft and kind of why um, I keep coming back to public aquariums when I do this work, right? So they're really integral to the development, spread, and retention of tank craft knowledge, right? They're not just... Um, using this information to educate the public or um, you know, to show exhibits. These things are really useful, but their development and retention of that knowledge keeps it um, and allows it to spread throughout the network in a really useful way. So some tank systems start in the public aquarium, not all of them. Tonight I'm gonna to talk about um, chrysal tanks, which are jelly tanks. Um, those didn't start in public aquariums, they didn't start as exhibition tanks, they started in um, laboratories. Um, others, though, are refined here, and that's what the tank system is that I'm gonna talk about tonight, is um, basically the refinement of that. Um, but the movement of people in and out of the aquarium really moves that knowledge, and so one of the useful things about public aquariums is that you always have this rotation of people in and out. Um, people, especially that volunteer, um, come into the aquarium, they develop knowledge and skills, and then they leave. Some of them go to graduate school and take those skills into laboratory settings. Um, some of them continue into the hobbyist community, and that really rotates that knowledge in and out. Um, but what's really useful is that, especially with aquariums that stay open for a really long time, 
um, they're stable institutions. So if you have a grant and you have a laboratory, you may learn to keep um, a system for a short amount of time, but the minute that grant is over, you kind of dismantle those tanks and you go on your way and you never write um, a paper that says, here's how we learned to keep these lobster or you know clam or any of those things alive for an extended period of time. So you just kind of, you're done. You, you set up shop, you take it down, and then you're done. In the hobbyist community, it's even more ephemeral, right? You might post to online boards about how you're doing something. Even now, there's not even magazines anymore. It really is all just chat rooms and Facebook and things like that. But if you figure out something really exciting about how to keep an organism alive, um, you know, it's gone the minute you stop participating in that community, right? So that's um, really ephemeral, but public aquariums are the place where that craft is continuously used and refined and then maintained, right? So anyone who comes in and out can kind of take that knowledge with them. So tonight, I'm just going to talk a little bit generally about the history of um, aquarium tanks, and, and most of that first section is so that I get to show you some really fun pictures. It's very rare that I get to stand in front of an audience of people that I think are going to be really as excited about the history of aquariums as I am. Um, and sometimes I'm just, I go into archives and I find these things and I think, yeah, I'm going to show those to people someday. Um, and then I'm going to talk very specifically about chrysal tanks. They're a really interesting type of tank and especially here at the aquarium today, there's just some really beautiful exhibits. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how those tanks were refined and why um, they're so important for the marine biology community, and then just kind of wrap it up a little bit to talk about the, the role of tank craft and the production of knowledge about the ocean and biology more generally. Awesome. Um, so the earliest tanks at public aquariums were really just filled with the things that could be gotten close by. Um, so the gentleman here, this is Charles Hibbard. He was the first collector at the Steinhardt, and this is an image of him with his collecting van. He used to go to um, just basically any beach or place that he could find. He, he would talk to local fishermen, and they would tell him where good fishing holes were, and those were the first exhibits at the Steinhardt. This is him going actually to a place called Pebble Beach where he used to get the rocks, and he would bring them back. That's what he used to line the tanks with. Um, in the middle is a special car that was built by uh, the Philadelphia Fish and Wildlife to take their fish back and forth. So most of the earliest um, tanks were filled with freshwater fish, and most of them were not pretty, not very exciting. I was so excited today to see the steelhead trout exhibition, and not just because it's beautiful, because it really is quite lovely, um, but because in the beginning, like, like all, every aquarium tank was filled with trout because they were something that they could keep alive and get quickly from their fish and wildlife, right? So anything that died, they just go out, they get some bass, they get a trout, they get a catfish, and that's what they had in there. Um, and the guy on the right, um, is also from the Philadelphia Aquarium. His last name is Van Dusen. He eventually, he eventually went on to found the Key West Aquarium, but that's him on his first collecting trip to Key West, and he's standing on all of the boxes full of fish, and they've got these watered filters in there that you can get into. But that was only done about once a year, and when those tropical fish died, usually when the temperatures dropped in the Northeast for the first time, um, they would just go back to this kind of system of filling up these tanks, right? So you end up, this is what the back looked like. This is the back of the New York Aquarium in 1919. So pretty standard tank system. Um, we would recognize it. They have the lights and the walkway. And you would get kind of these, uh, these more simple tank structures, right? Um, nothing too fancy, <laughs> no floral, um, no live floral exhibits because they didn't have the light to be able to allow those to grow. Everything was done by skylight. Um, and so you can kind of see it was, it was whatever you could find in there. And this is, this is the Belle Isle Aquarium in Detroit in 1906. And this is really what these tanks often looked like, right? Very simplistic. Um, I just really like this image of tank maintenance and fish maintenance because that's a, um, a pretty happy little lake sturgeon there. <laughs> Um, those things change, right? And so um, quickly you start to get the development of specialized tanks. They don't always come first 
at public aquariums. So the first kind of specialized tank um, that is developed was um, the first Chrysal tank. It's called a uh, plunger tank. And really, it was this guy, Edward Brown. He's at the Plymouth Laboratory at the Marine Biological Association in England. And what he um, wanted to do was try to keep jellyfish alive longer, right? And what he noticed is he would be out um, on the water, and he would see that jellies really did not pulsate very much when they were in the wild. They would just kind of float around. Uh, but when he would get them into the laboratory, they would settle onto the bottom, and then they would just lie there for a very long time. They would develop these white spots, and then they would die pretty quickly. And so he thought, well, maybe I can fix this so that they can float uh, on the top of the water. And so what he did was develop this plunger jar. And one of the things that I really love about tank craft is that usually the thing people like uh, the most is successfully keeping something alive and doing it as cheap as humanly possible, which is like a thing in the field. Like if you can do it for under $5, pretty much you're a hero. And so this is the first time that someone really succeeded in that. There's a, a, a tin over here, a treacle tin, and it works to um, push this plunger there's a piece of flat glass on there, and it goes back and forth, up and down in a lever pulley system. Um, and it works really, really well, actually. Brown ended up keeping um, a couple different species alive for an extended period. He just gave it up. He had to go back to work um, in the fall to go teach, so he was like, forget it. Um, but it was the first time that someone had kind of successfully maintained uh, jellies in a captive environment. <clears throat> What happened is not necessarily um, that it caught on super quickly, but people started to fiddle around with it. So actually, um, there were, it split into two different groups. And one group said, OK, well, I see that you can keep jellyfish alive with this new tank. Um, I'm going to work on the tank. So some people started working on the technology, and some people started working on how they ate. Right. So at the time, it was believed that um, Jellies were strict vegetarians. They didn't eat other fish. Um, and so they kept dying in captivity because they couldn't figure out what they ate. So the, um, on the left here is Maud Delap. She's in the middle. She's an Irish woman um, who lived on an island um, and ended up, was the first to get um, a jelly through a complete season. And she ended up, it died only because there was a huge storm. She couldn't get out to get enough fish for it to eat. But she's the first to put into print um, that they eat so much that basically her jellyfish would eat as many fish as she could like shove into that tank at any given moment. Like She was like, it ate me out of house and home. Um, and she wrote a lot of really important papers about this and was followed by another woman named Mary Labore, um, who also drew some really fantastic stuff of tentacles and fish. There was a, it was fantastic. But they were the first to work out kind of um, the care of these organisms uh, using the plunger jar and um, feeding. On the right uh, was a set of uh, rocking jars that was developed in 1937. Um, by also people at Plymouth. And basically, it was for the younger um, polyps and ephyra to try to get them through into the adult phase so that they could get them through a life cycle. Um, but that's 30 years apart, right, where someone goes from the plunger jar to that rocking jar, right? After that, you get another big jump, 30 more years. Um, a guy named Wolf Grieve, who's in Germany, um, develops what he calls the plankton chrysal. Uh, and it's this one on the left here. And he's the first to develop. He puts a sand filter at the bottom, and there's a jet of air, and it causes this top-like motion, which he likes more. Um, for the jellies, and so he finds it really useful. He's a biologist, he's at a marine laboratory, and he's interested in watching behavior, and so he develops this particular system, right? And then over here, he develops a double one. You can just kind of see the jellies in that picture, um, but that system is just side by side so that he could compare two different groups. So what happens um, is that this particular community um, in Germany 
people start to really use that particular system and they find it really useful and then it flips over into Japan. Right? So you can see why I like to follow this technology because internationally, it just goes all over the place. People are talking to each other and the way that they're doing it is just through journals mostly. Um, people say, oh, I picked up your journal. This laboratory group um, does a lot of journal work. And so this particular uh, group over here is in a laboratory. They pick up Greaves' work and they say, we're going to use your particular technology and we're going to try to get moon jellies to reproduce. Right? So they're the first group um, to really go after this. And what they do is um, they work out feeding brine shrimp. So the first community to, to feed jelly is brine shrimp, which seems like a pretty big deal, um, but everyone does it now. Um, and then uh, Yoshiko Kakanuma succeeds in inducing strobilation. So she's the first in captivity to get a jellyfish to strobilate so that she can reproduce, right? And the way she does that is to use a combination of um, temperature and um, water. And so she just keeps changing the water temperature until, until they kind of strobilate for her. Um, this is a really big deal. At the time, the reason why people are so interested in this is they want to use this for research. So there's a lot of people using it for heart research. And then they're also um, very, very interested all of a sudden in using it at public aquariums, right? So people get really, really interested in displaying moon jellies very specifically in both um, Germany and Berlin and in Japan. So at the same time, at the zoo aquarium in Japan, um, Abe and Asada um, decide that they are going to use all of this information that's been accrued over 60 years and try to get moon jellies through a complete cycle. So they want the adult to, um, they want it to go all the way through so that they can get multiple generations. Right? This is really useful for them for a lot of different reasons, but one is that they're just tired of collecting all the time. Right? They just want a stable line of moon jellies so that they can keep them on exhibit constantly. Um, and so they work with it, and the only thing that they really change is that um, they, they just keep a regular temperature and use brine shrimp, and um, instead of using Brown's plunger jar, they use a more gentle kind of um, set of bubbles that comes up. So they say, you know what? It's actually kind of tearing them apart <laughs> to use the plunger jar. We're not too happy with that anymore. So they just use a little bit of bubbling, and it works really, really nicely. And in 1968, they go to a general meeting of the Japanese Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and they give their talk on how they've done this. Right? What's really, really useful about this is that it's the first time that someone comes through and says, here's what I fed them and here's how I housed them. Um, and they bring together at the aquarium this really, really beautiful set of knowledge. Right. So aquariums, once the, um, these tanks, the jelly tanks kind of enter the aquarium, that set of knowledge, what they get fed and how you house them stick together in a way that kind of creates a really useful set of knowledge and people start to use it and pass it around, right? Um, there was a guy, William Ham, uh, Hamner, he's at UCLA at this time and he's a biological oceanographer and he's really, really interested in looking at um, um, things that swim in the water column in the open ocean, that's what he studies, like plankton and things like that. And he's using, um, the plankton chrysal to look at those things. He makes it out of acrylic, which is the first person to do it, and he does some lighting changes, nothing too drastic, but what's really useful here is that he loans his tank um, in 1988 to David Powell. David Powell um, is at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is really, really important because uh, he's putting together this new exhibit at this brand new, very fancy aquarium in California. Um, and he wants to use Hamner's design, right? So he says, what can we do with this? And he gets together with Freya Sumner, uh, who is uh, 
in charge of husbandry there or is one of the, the people that does husbandry there. Um, and she gets in touch with Abe and Hisada in Japan and they tell her exactly what they did with the moon jellies. What's even more interesting is that they trade her moon jellies. So they say, it's not just that here's what we did, we're gonna give these to you. That's also really important because um, their moon jellies respond in a slightly different way, actually, than ones that are collected from California. So the fact that she started with those is a really interesting thing because they respond very differently in the tank. Um, and the thing that she did is she started off not just giving them brine shrimp, but soaked in this Selco. Um, and that seemed to help them quite a bit grow. So it's like a pr an extra fat protein type of thing. Um, and they worked together, power and, um, summer to calibrate these lighting, temperature, and food to close the cycle. And by the time they do their first jelly exhibit, they close the cycle on 17 different species, right? So it goes from generally people being able to keep moon jellies and a few others randomly in captivity to 17 species that they can give very specific parameters on how they're kept in captivity. Um, and that's super quick. There's somewhere in here, by the way, there's somewhere in here that there's the introduction of the Langmuir chrysal as well, which is the double uh, chrysal, and I can't trace where that, so if anyone knows who invented that tank, I would love to hear <laughs> if you know who did that. Um, but this is the work that they publish, and you would think, right, that you would get this really huge triumphant, this is exactly how you do this, but instead, there's two published papers on this um, by Summer, and then there's some information in Powell's autobiography, um, which is definitely worth a read. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, but these are the species, and so they would tell you um, what species, what their diet is at the aquarium, the temperature that they keep it in the tank, and how long they've been able to keep those species. Um, The ones that are, are really interesting are the ones that they're still feeding um, wild plankton because those are the ones that they have to go out and collect for, which is really annoying. Um, but it's particularly interesting to see how quickly this happens when it gets into the, um, the public aquarium. So why is this important? Why have I just spent all this time telling you about the set of tanks, right? Um, and part of that is because it's clear that there's all these different groups that are contributing to knowledge production, right? So um, there are people in laboratories. They really want these jellyfish because they want to work on them um, for neurophysiology or for uh, research. So one of the people in, in the middle of this particular story that's doing work um, is a woman at the University of Arkansas who's doing cardiology research. And she goes down to um, the Gulf of Mexico and collects moon jellies and brings them back up and learns to keep them so that she can work on their, um, basically to see their musculature so she can figure out how the heart is supposed to work. There are great things happening in the middle of Arkansas. People don't talk about that as often as they should. Um, but you know, public aquariums are these spaces where the technique and technology kind of settle into each other and develop. So you get these different groups of people at laboratories, at medical um, schools, and then at public aquariums. But it's at the public aquarium where you have to keep the animals for extended periods of time and where you want them to kind of thrive in a very different way. Like you're not just there to keep them uh, alive you're there to help them thrive, right? So that they can be um, useful, good educational tools, but also beautiful to look at, right? Um, a raggedy jellyfish is not ever a good thing at a public aquarium. And so the development of exhibition specimens creates this really perfect space where you refine technology so that you get consistency and longevity, and it's really nice. Um, and in the 1980s, uh, aquariums really become the epicenter of that network in a big way. So it's not just that they learn to do this, they become the place where people go to learn to do this, right? So there are spaces for tank craft innovation, there are spaces for retention, spaces for knowledge distribution. So on this side, um, 
like I said, Summer doesn't go out of her way to tell people how she did. I mean, she publishes for the, the aquarium community, but she doesn't publish for the, the hobbyist community in any big way. It wasn't until just a few years ago that someone at Monterey, Chad Widmer, um, published How to Keep Jellyfish in Aquariums, which is a really, really useful book if you're a home hobbyist. He teaches you how to... Um, inspect jellyfish, how to order food online, how to grow your own food, how to build your own tank. Um, there's a review of this book on the back of the book that just says, dude, this book is gold. And I hope someone will review my book in a similar ma manner. So if you just keep that in mind, it will be fantastic. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting uh, way to distribute knowledge through an, in a larger network of people. They also at Monterey and at other places, but Monterey very specifically, um, have net, they have um, programs to bring people in to teach them hands-on husbandry for jellyfish. So some of the um, aquarists that I've talked to throughout the United States have actually done their training at Monterey. So they'll bring them in and they'll do training. Some of it's not formal. They'll say, oh, you're a new aquarist and, you, and we need you to know this thing. I'm going to send you to Monterey for a couple of days. Um, and that was obviously a couple of years ago that I spoke to people who were doing that. Um, but it's a kind of informal way that people are spreading that knowledge throughout the aquarium community. <clears throat> so this is really useful because you get this knowledge about tanks and it spreads throughout the marine biology community and uh, that's really lovely or throughout the aquarium community. But there are kind of larger implications to knowing how to keep jellyfish alive, right? And it's not just about exhibition and it's not just about pretty jellyfish. Um, so the Monterey Bay Aquarium is the first to describe the complete life cycle of these five jellies. Um, cross jelly, flower hat, egg yolk, Pacific sea nettle, and purple striped jelly, right? So those are direct contributions to just basic marine biology. We know what the life cycle looks like, and we can tell you how it, it functions, right, in this particular way. And they're also uh, describing the life cycle of two deep sea jellies, whose names I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, and this is really important, right? Um, for a lot of different reasons, but one is just because jellyfish are becoming more and more popular um, as indicators of ecosystem health and as, uh, as laboratory experimental animals again. So they were very popular laboratory experimental animals from about 1880 to 1930, and then they dropped off because there were a lot of things that you could experiment with that were a little bit easier to take care of. I've just told you the whole rigmarole that goes into trying to take care of jellyfish. But now, um, people are re-looking at, like, re-taking up the jelly as these experimental organisms that can be really useful. Um, this this is how old I'm getting, is I was like, remember that article just the other day in the New York Times about the immortal jellyfish? That article's from 2012. Yeah, I was like, oh, that was seven years ago. I am not as young as I used to be. Um, this particular article here is particularly interesting um, about how jellyfish sleep. Um, and this one that just came out yesterday, that jellyfish slime may be a solution to microplastic pollution. Um, there's also obviously my personal favorite uh, set of jellies, moon jellies, um, where they sent moon jellies up to space and raised them there and then brought them back down to see if they could um, orient because the things that they have in their bells are very similar to what we have in our inner ear. Um, and without gravity, they did not learn to orient correctly, so they kind of swim sideways. Let that be a lesson for everyone who's thinking of having babies in space, that their kids will not be able to walk on land very well. So this is really useful, right? Uh, the contributions that, that aquariums make to the larger understanding of the ocean comes in a lot of different ways, but one of those is just the maintenance of tank craft, right? You can't learn as much about a marine organism if you can't view it um, in its whole life cycle, or you don't even know what that life cycle looks like. There are a lot of animals when they're mature that look very different than when they're a juvenile, right? And so if you can raise them all the way through their life cycle in an aquarium, you can kind of figure out what you're looking at in the wild. There are other tanks that I work on 
um, that you can see how this um, works out in a different way. And so this particular tank, I already showed, showed you my horrible um, PowerPoint mistake. But uh, the other set of tanks that I work on are breeding tanks. Right, and these are, are particularly interesting for a lot of different reasons. This is a set of tanks at the University of Florida um, Aquaculture Center in near Orlando. Um, and on the right-hand side, this is the F1 generation of the first captive bred blue tangs um, that they've bred there. What's really useful about this particular type of technology um, is all of the things that you can learn about um, fish physiology that you might not know otherwise, right? So when you captive breed, this is the first generation, some of the things that they're still trying to work out here is feeding schedule. So at what time um, in the developmental life of a fish do you feed them a certain amount of fats or a certain amount of proteins? What do they need in order to develop correctly? And this first generation, they had some coloration issues, which were particularly interesting. Um, and it's because they can't quite figure out when they should be feeding them exactly um, uh, the right type of food. But that's really helpful when you're also thinking about wild populations, right? What are the requirements and ecosystem and ecological needs of a population that we're really worried about, right? What is it about the reef ecosystem that is so important to these organisms? And how can we figure that out by calibrating their environment within a laboratory? Um, this is also really useful because conservation-wise, one of the reasons that they're doing this work is not just to figure out what these organisms need in the wild, but to decrease the requirement that aquariums have on wild populations, right? So um, they're working really hard to supply um, SeaWorld and Epcot with these blue tangs so that they can stop getting them from reefs and decrease their stress on those reef populations. And so I think they're through the second or third generation and um, are starting to, to really ramp up their um, development of these particular systems. But these are just really large tanks. And they're also working, one of the most interesting things in this lab to me is they're working on um, the fish. You guys have this really beautiful pink tank um, of fish and you have this great sign that says um, that they change from female to male. Uh, they're working in these tanks to figure out what is the mechanism that a tropical fish, what makes them change, and then how do you get them to breed? And that's a really beautiful thing. They haven't figured it out yet for those species, but when they do, it'll be really interesting both to the aquarium community and also to the marine biology community, right? It's useful knowledge to have. Another way that this works out is in coral reef tanks, right? So. Um, if you read any news about coral reefs, um, they are in danger <laughs> uh, for a lot of different reasons. And one of the things that people have tried to do is bioengineer corals. Um, and a group that has started, this is a coral reef group, all of these people are connected in this particular network. Um, and it's a um, network for um, sea core is what it's called, it's sexual coral reproduction. And so they're not just interested in developing, um, in planting corals that they find, they're interested in a particular type of corals and getting them to sexually reproduce so that they can maintain genetic kind of variability within these communities. Um, but it's really, really hard to get corals to sexually reproduce in captivity. Um, and so you have people, like um, Mike Britson, who's down here from the Columbus Zoo, um, and Mark Schick, who's from the Shedd Aquarium, they're building these systems. Um, here's a substrate where they plant um, coral polyps, and up there is a set of tanks uh, at Shedd, and basically what they're doing is trying to transpose what they do in aquarium tanks into this larger system so that they can plant coral into uh, spaces and kind of garden that coral um, in communities to try to save these um, communities. So you can see this is a whole group of people that works together to do this. Um, and then you have these rather small communities, the St. Lucie County Aquarium where I did some uh, research uh, about a year and a half ago. They just keep corals. They're one of, they are the longest, um, running reef tank in the world. 
so it was started at the Smithsonian and then transferred to that particular aquarium. It's tiny, but that image is of um, a coral sexually reproducing in the middle of the night in a lunar cycle, and they did get that to happen. So, um, and it's a, they have active and open conversations with the rest of this network through kind of just like email exchanges and things like that, right? So when I track this particular community, um, what I see is that these public aquariums are contributing really heavily to conservation. And sometimes it's really apparent, but a lot of times it's through the technological kind of know-how that they've developed in keeping coral alive in captivity for an extended period. So these people on the right are really going out into the field and putting that into kind of conservation use and doing that kind of research. But, but these people on the left are, are the people with like the technological know-how, right? Um, so it's a really fun group to study. So just in general, tank craft is really integral to the development and spread of marine biological knowledge, right? You get physiology, you get ecology, and you get conservation in these ways that I think are pretty surprising, right? When you look at a tank, you think, oh, that's an interesting tank, and there are fish in it, and that's very exciting. But it really is performing a really useful intellectual function, and there are a lot of different communities that come to that tank and get something very different out of it, right? Um, but public aquariums, just in general, are really important nodes in that network of craft knowledge producers, and they anchor the marine biology community when it comes to technological know-how, and they basically help extend that knowledge over multiple generations so that we don't lose it, right? So that's what I have for you tonight. I'm just going to thank these people who were nice enough to talk to me. <laughs> All right, who has a question? I'll bring you a microphone. Question or comment? We got one there, and then you'll be next. I enjoyed your lecture immensely. I had hold, hold the microphone closer to your mouth, Francis. I enjoyed your lecture immensely. I learned quite a bit. It's, it's very intriguing. I was wondering, because with um, global warming, marine pollution, and all the things that are happening in the ocean, and the marine life having to learn how to survive, survival of the fittest. Have you studied the process of what they go through to survive? And is perhaps part of the problem with, with uh, the aquariums, the, the things that you're building, um, is it's so perfect that that's kind of holding them back because they become lazy because it's so perfect and <laughs> they're not able. I'm trying to use wording where it kind of makes sense when I say lazy, they don't have to move, try, because uh, if a person needs to struggle to stay alive, they'll find ways to take the next step. So I was wondering, has there been any studies of like altering the environment to kind of push them to try to find the zest for living and to move forward? Yeah, so it's really interesting. There are two really cool answers to this, and one of them, um, I'll get to in just a second, but one is that, especially with the coral, um, those are people that they are selecting species very carefully that have already shown that they're particularly good in environments that are already kind of out of control. So these are the corals that are surviving in what we already know are rapidly diminishing ecosystems. Um, the really interesting thing that's, that's quite different about aquariums than zoos and the, and the tank environment is the turnover generationally. So you might say, oh, okay, you have a tiger and they're in captivity and they, they forget how to hunt because they're just in this cage and they don't know how to hunt. Um, the generation of fish or coral or anything, it's so quick that if you immediately put it back into the water, you know, it's unclear what's happening in that very quick generation. So it's not clear that they would forget how to do anything or lose any skills. It is, however, a bit of a concern if you don't have this constant exchange that they will get too comfortable because, again, that's like very quick generation, right? People are doing studies on those things, and I, and I expect that they'll ramp up as we have more requirements of captivity. Um, 
The second really cool thing, though, is accidental discoveries, which is my favorite, my favorite thing about aquariums. So um, that aquarium in um, the tank in the St. Lucie County Aquarium, it has a sister tank that was also built by a guy named Walter A.D. He built the one at the Smithsonian, and he built one at Biosphere 2. Um, he was responsible for those tanks. And what happened in Biosphere is that they had a huge CO2 problem. So this is the first model tank that I've seen. They had data that their coral could survive way higher CO2 levels than we had ever seen um, coral survive. So what's interesting is that they were accidentally pushing that tank for those corals to survive, and then they have data on it. It's never really been written up. I just happened to read it, and this is why I go out and give talks. I'm like, guess about the cool stuff I read that no one ever wrote about. Um, but so you see that actually more often than you would think, this weird accidental, oh, we this tank got a little colder than we expected. And sometimes it results in really cool stuff. Like that strobilation, they were trying to push those jellies into. But there have been times in which um, they haven't been able to get organisms to breed. And then something happens with the parameters. And then all of a sudden, they breed. And you're like, oh, wow, that's really useful to know that they just wanted colder water or warmer water. So in general, um, one of the interesting things to think about is not of a, of a tank system as being completely static all the time. It goes through changes. Um, and so to not imagine that we have as much control as one, might, as one might think and that the animals are going through maybe a little bit more change than we imagine that we can know about. Um, I w had a question about the um, blue tangs when you were doing the experiments on those or re reporting that. Um, do they get larger in a larger tank like the um, th 13 for a dollar goldfish do? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, is, and also, how do you take blood samples? Do you do a dorsal fin or is that old news? You know, I don't know because okay. I, I don't get to touch the fish very often, okay. which I'm not going to lie is pleasant to me. Um, <laughs> They, you know, the University of Florida does this work. And one of the things that I absolutely love, I went to Florida State. So if you hear me say anything about how I love the University of Florida, you know I must really respect them. Because if you don't know how much we hate each other, I'm just going to say for all of you watching at home that it's a deep level of dislike. Um, so if I've said anything nice about the University of Florida, it's amazing. Um, if you ask them anything, their job, um, their land grant school, their job, if you ask them, is to tell you how they do their work, right? They are a public outreach, fish and wildlife, like that's their job. And what's really useful about that is that they're, they, I, I have talked to people, I've said, hey, could I come down and like look at your archives or do whatever? And they'd be like, ah, uh, no. I called the University of Florida and they were like, do you want to come here or would you like us to drive to your house? Right? I mean, and I thought, wow, you guys are really open about this. But that's their job is to educate the public, right? If you call your land grant school, that's their job. And so if you want to know how they do anything, you can call them up and they're going to tell you. They'll probably send you a diagram about it. That's just gorgeous. What makes it really beautiful is that that's a really great, interesting way that tank craft spreads, that they don't write about that. Their job is interpersonal communication, so that's really cool. Um, there are some, the, same, the reason that I got interested in that is they gave a few of those F1s to the aquarium that I was at, and I would watch them every day. They, you could tell that they weren't quite the same as wild caught, and I thought it was particularly interesting, but they look size-wise just the same to me. But other people would know about those things better than I. I want to ask you something. I want you to imagine for a second. I'm the mayor of Hoboken. <laughs> I've, called, I've called the president of Stevens Institute, and, and I've said, we've decided we're going to build an aquarium. We need some advice. And the president says, we have this amazing woman. And she's writing a book about aquariums. And she's been all over the country and the world studying these. And uh, I'm sure she would help. So I, he gives me your phone number. And I call you. So my question to you then is, we're going to build an aquarium in Hoboken. Tell me the 10 things you would recommend we do or not do to make this one of the world's great mid-size aquariums. Ooh, build it in California, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Don't build an aquarium in Hoboken. Um, 
I say that because, gosh, I came today and I thought, oh, I'm going to be inside all day. And I forgot that in California you get to go outside. It's so nice to have a half an aquarium outside, you guys. Um, yeah, that's a great question. This is like my ultimate dream. Aquarium consultant would be my like, dream come true. This is your chance because this is my somebody chance. from Hoboken Someone is probably Hoboken watching <laughs> remotely. So. Um, you know what? It's First of all, I, I would say uh, build on a hill because Hoboken is going to be underwater really soon. Um, yeah, it's a really good question because every aquarium is really different. Right, and when you go to each individual one, like we've talked about tonight, um, when you go to a good aquarium, you're like, ah, I love this tank. Like today I could have sat in front of that trout tank all day. That might just be a weird love of trout that I have. I could have sat there all day. Um, there are things that people just absolutely love. But what's interesting about visitors to public aquariums is that um, they just really want to see wonder sometimes, right? So when the Shedd Aquarium opened in 1930, um, it initially opened without anything in its tanks. It was just the tanks with no water. <laughs> and it had thousands of visitors. People lined up for hours to see these tanks. That's so weird. When the Philadelphia Aquarium was at the St. Louis um, exhibition uh, in 1906, uh, the fish kept dying and people came back day after day just to look at dead fish and like whatever. So what would I say? Um, I think local, like anything that has local flair to it is a really lovely thing to see. When you're in Florida and you see mangroves, which is, is an area that you may have even heard of as a Florida kid but never really seen, right? When you're in Tennessee and you see um, rivers that you have not really, you can imagine what's underneath them, but not really see that. I think those are really, really powerful. So I would say the local element is the thing I would love to see. In Hoboken, it would, I mean, I would love to see um, oyster tanks, right? It's a, it's an environment that was built on oysters and then we effectively exterminated them by eating them all. <laughs> they were, but, you know, to show people, um, what the ecosystem used to look like and what it can be built up to, to be again. So that's not that's not 10. You could have 10 oyster tanks. I don't think that's going <laughs> to excite anyone, but you could do it. Um, but, but in general, I think that kind of local visionary kind of impact is really nice. Um, people can go to a, you know, a pet store and see, you know, anything, but you got to show them something really cool, like a trout. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have an, another question or comment? All right, now. You said that the moon jellies are being eyed carefully in the field of cardiology. And I'm just wondering how that's possible because I learned they don't have a heart. What are they studying? Awesome. So this is a great question. So um, they're studying the moon jelly as the wall of the heart, right? So it's, they, they are um, an organism that, for a long time, the reason that people started studying jellies and the reason why Brown develops his tank is because there's this big question, do they have a rudimentary um, nervous system or not? And if they do, is that the evolution, right? So that starts, Darwin says, okay, there's this evolution, and here's what all these people are doing. Um, and a guy named George Romanos, who is a big Darwin fan, comes along and he starts using jellyfish. And the reason he uses jellyfish is because um, he can no longer vivisect dogs without people getting mad at him. But he says, well, if you have a problem with me cutting up jellyfish, then you probably shouldn't eat oysters, right? I mean, it's a, it's a be beautiful and brutal part of his uh, scientific treatise when he talks about that. But um, there's a big debate back and forth on if they have a, a nervous system or not. But when people start to, um, to work on that nervous system, it's kind of like a, like a fibrous network. And you, can, and you can cut it in many different ways, and the nerve uh, will still pass through it. And so basically, there were a lot of people doing studies on um, electrical stimulation and muscle control with them because they're particularly useful and you don't need a whole animal. You can actually excise a lot of that, uh, get rid of it and just use kind of excised tissue. And so as long as you can keep them alive in the laboratory in a kind of weird way, you can study them. So there was a lot of, a lot of early heart studies were done on them. 
Um, the other one was loggerhead turtle hearts. <laughs> and they were, they were obviously not easy to get. So they, they thought jellyfish would be a little bit easier. Yeah. All right, I'm going to walk back, and I want either Sandy or Nate to say something about our involvement in sea core and super corals. So who do I come to? I come to Nate. So what have you been doing, Nate? Oh, well, yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to join the Sea Corps group down at Carmabi, which was in your slide uh, last October, and uh, soon I'll be going out uh, to Palau uh, next month to help with some of their coral spawning and research, so uh, working with Dr. James Guest, and um, yeah, very exciting. We, we've, his, we've supported Sea Corps for the past probably five or six years, uh, largely working Guam. Um, with you guys need a consultant <laughs> at all, a historical consultant in the tropics, because I am for that. Yeah. No, I think that's. I think that was an excellent example, especially with uh, Dirk, um, who was an aquarium guy in uh, Rotterdam, and and really just took aquarium science, went and got his PhD, and uh, went out and started his own conservation initiative, and really draws from the aquarium sector to get volunteer support, which we support, uh, financial support, etc. So. He also has uh, done something that's incredibly important, which is that that particular group is the first that I've seen to really start publishing in a robust way about the craft that they're doing. So the work that I do is trying to trace this and really just walk around and ask people like where they learned to do this. And the answer is usually, I don't know, I learned it from someone else. Why don't you go talk to them, right? And then I'll hit the end of the line. Um, and there's a couple books that have come out of Rotterdam and areas that... Um, they're just incredibly helpful, but they're the first of, of their kind that I've seen to kind of get all of this stuff together. And it's really exciting to me as a historian to see that first generation of, because it's just not there otherwise. Yeah. And Sam, I know Nate won't admit to this, but um, he was the first to design a full-blown moon jelly touch tank, which you may not have seen, but if you get the chance, if you're here tomorrow, Definitely check it out because it is quite a unique tank design. I think you'd really enjoy it. So, so you can you can touch them. Uh, yeah, well, super corals are also something we're looking at. And Nate, when uh, he goes to Palau, will be helping with a project there involving sea core and super corals. But b basically, we're looking at uh, changing that pink tank that you mentioned, possibly, into a future super coral exhibit where we're highlighting those corals that are thermally resilient mm -hmm. and can tolerate bleaching events and then helping to propagate those corals here so that researchers can study them. So we're really excited about that partnership. It's super exciting. Uh, and you know, we talk a lot about bleaching and, and things like that, but I mentioned in the beginning the um, coral disease, which is also another problem from climate change. So as the ocean warms, you, you get more you know, um, of these particular issues. And there are a lot of tanks that people have accidentally gotten infected and they're doing some really interesting studies on those as well so um you know i just happened to run into secor because they're so awesome and so like integral like the public aquarium group but those are other people that are doing great work too when do you expect your book will be out that is a great a great question um i i i expect it will be out soon uh, not <laughs> these people who who have known me for ten or twelve years are laughing. Um, no, I uh, I should be finishing up the writing this summer. Yeah. So it won't get come out though before the end of the year anyway. I, oh no, I wouldn't imagine. So, but when no. it does come out, we'd like to have you come back, give a talk about your book, and we'll combine it with a book signing. All right? I would. Yes. So I'm I counting would. on your friends to pressure her. Oh. Pressure you. They're, they will do so. I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, they right? get out of Hoboken in February, it's not bad. <laughs> it's, I, it should be pretty warm here is what I'm looking for. Is All right, before we thank there. Sam for a really good lecture, a wonderful lecture, uh, next Tuesday, 7 o'clock, Manuel Pastor, who is a professor at USC, has a new book. Uh, well, I guess it's been out a couple of years. But anyway, it's about the collapse of California, the resurgence of California, uh, and what this could mean for the future of America. I think it has some good lessons in it, so we hope that we'll see you next week. Please join me in thanking Sam for a great lecture. <laughs>